we will move ahead with our with our program and uh, as we've mentioned earlier we've had some changes so we'll be unable to hear from Dr. Gracia this morning who is the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Min Minority Health but next on the program we do have a very dynamic speaker as well uh, Dr. George Askew Chief Medical Officer and Administration for Children and Family at Health and Human Services. Now, Dr. Askew is a board-certified pediatrician with a long history of innovative work in child and family advocacy. But as before and in the medical tradition, we'd like you to know a little bit about the person. So I wanted to share with you that he was born and brought up in the inner city of Cleveland, Ohio. He was a Head Start graduate and later attended Harvard University and received a BA in psychology and social relations. He even played Harvard rugby in 1984. We had the Surgeon General in Rochester and he was in Harvard playing rugby. So uh, he's a graduate of Case Western Reserve School of Medicine, uh, did his residency at uh, Rainbow Children's Hospital in Cleveland and has many, many awards and citations and elegant jobs, but currently has been appointed by the Obama administration to serve as the first chief medical officer for the Administration for Children and Families at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. And in this role, he provides expert advice and consultation to the Secretary for Children and Family. And it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Askew. All right, what do I, how does all this work here? So I just push this, that'll do the, all right, very good. Well, um, good after, is it still morning? I guess it is still morning, right? So good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for having me. I, I believe that this is, is this the last uh, group of presentations before lunch? Right, so we have to be really fast and get you through to your lunch. I know what it's like to have people standing between me and my food. Um, I'm delighted to be here, and I think this is the second time I've spoken uh, to, this, to, this, to, to this group. Um, and really, always excited to come back to Pew. Have lots of friends here um, uh, at, at the uh, at the foundation, and. Um, I want to make sure before I start to bring you greetings from the Acting Assistant Secretary of the Administration for Children and Families, Mark Greenberg, and of course from Secretary Sebelius, um, who uh, of course is, uh, this is an important issue for her and an important issue for, for Mark uh, as well, and they're, they're happy that I could be here today to, to talk to you. Let's see. Bingo. Um, so, uh, Today I'm just going to cover the, the overall structure and mission of the Administration for Children and Families. Um, and one of the reasons I do that is because a lot of folks don't really understand what we do at ACF so well. And I think it's important to understand what we do at ACF to see how we sort of fit into this picture uh, with respect to so supporting breastfeeding. And also I think ACF's just a pretty interesting place. Um, I'll talk a little bit about what my role is as the Chief Medical Officer and give some examples of how ACF's, uh, ACF programs support support breastfeeding. Uh, first of all, you, you may ask, or some of you may ask, why do we even have a, a medical officer in a human services agency? And I'm hoping for those of you who aren't asking that question, it's because you actually know the answer and this has all become quite clear to you that um, you can't have good health without strong human services and you can't have uh, strong human services without having the outcome be good health. So, um, you know, why does this particular topic matter to me at all? Well, I, I'm in a unique position um, as an actively, uh, you know, sort of uh, in two roles, an, an actively practicing pediatrician for many years and serving again in the Department of Health and Human Services as a chief medical officer in ACF, a, a human services, a traditional human services agency that does quite a good bit of health. Um, you know, what I tell young docs in training um, and young physicians who are, you know, just finishing up their training is that uh, you know 75 percent of families are going to ask you in their at some point during their office visits while you're seeing them uh, about child care issues and how they should take care of their kids should they be at home should they be in child care you know what kind of program is Head Start what kind of program is you know child care and um, 
uh, and while the 75% of it will ask about that, 100% of them will ask about nutrition and feeding issues. And so if you're going to go out and be a practicing doc, these are the things you have to sort of know like the back of your hand. Um, I also understand, of course, the clinical importance of, uh, of, of breastfeeding, and I don't need to explain this to you, to, to, to this crew. This is really, like, you know, again, speaking to the choir when, when we're discussing those issues. But as a chief medical officer, I want to make sure that we're supporting breastfeeding via addressing sort of effective delivery of human services that bolster the likelihood of, uh, of breastfeeding happening. So again, I said I'd talk a little bit about what ACF does and who we are. Um, uh, ACF's mission uh, is to foster health and well-being by providing federal leadership, partnership, and resources for the compassionate and effective delivery of human services. We are a fairly large agency, uh, over 1,300 federal employees and nearly 400 contractors in the agency. Uh, we were established in 1991 after the merging of the Family Support Administration and the Office of Human Develop Development Services. And we're right down here on uh, D Street Southwest. Our budget uh, is the second largest budget uh, in all of uh, Health and Human Services. So a lot of folks don't know that. Only CMS has a larger budget, so we're bigger than FDA, CDC, uh, NIH, all these other places you can imagine, um, uh, with more than 60 programs and $50 billion plus uh, in our budget. And you can see where a lot of this goes. Temporary assistance to needy families is a substantial part of the budget. Foster care and, and permanency, Head Start, uh, other big programs in the ACF. I'll talk a little bit more specifically about some of the programs we have uh, in ACF. Again, with the idea of giving, uh, part of the idea also is uh, as you think about the kind of work that you do uh, when you go back to your home, your home uh, offices, where we might be able to work with you and coordinate with you on some of the activities that you're doing. Um, so we think of it, we think of it, or at least I like to think of ACF as divided into four, four sections. One being family economic security. There we have the Office of Family Assistance. And again, I'm not going to be able to cover everything, so I'll just cover a few of these things. Um, the Office of Family Assistance, which has a temporary assistance to needy families, which you saw is about 35% of our budget. Uh, the Office of Community Services, which funds the nearly 1,000 community action agencies across the country. These are sort of the most trusted uh, uh, entities within, uh, within uh, uh, low-income communities in the country. We cover about 96% of the counties uh, in the United States. Uh, it administers programs like LIHEAP, which is the Low Income Home Energy Assistance Program for, uh, as one. We also have special populations. Uh, the Administration for Native Americans is within ACF, and it's really about promoting Native culture and, and, and maintaining Native culture. And the Office of Refugee Resettlement, which is another fairly large agency, which, um, which has been in the news a lot lately with respect to unaccompanied children crossing the border. 7,000 five years ago will be, as near, will be nearly 70,000 this year. Um, refugees and asylees and human trafficking among the folks that are... are um, served through the Office of Refugee Resettlement, including uh, repatriation of, uh, of expats when we're overseas. If something happens overseas and we have to be evacuated, it's Office of Refugee Resettlement who actually makes sure that we get back um, uh, repatriated safely. Children, of course, in the Administration for Children and Families, our early childhood group, uh, which has the Office of Child Care, the Office of Head Start, and our um, our our home visiting program, which is the tribal home visiting program, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about that later on when I talk specifically about uh, support of breastfeeding within within ACF. And then there's program support, so offices and units that have sort of broad purview over activities within, within ACF. Uh, so our Office of Public Affairs, our External Affairs Office, our Office of Human Services, Emergency Preparedness and Response. Uh, again, you, you know, when we think about emergency preparedness, we sort of think about the medical side often. We think about what has to happen to get people evacuated, where well, there's also a transition to getting people back to normal, and that's sort of the human services side of that. So when Head Start programs are closed down or child care programs are closed down because of hurricanes or accidents, uh, we go back in and get those things up and rolling again, because those are the things that are actually going to make the biggest difference in people's lives, at least in the way I think about how we do health. And of course, the chief medical officer. So my job is to really have sort of broad oversight of all the health activities that go on within ACF. And you can imagine within all of these human services agencies, there's a little bit of health going on in all of these things. And my, my goal is to make the connection between human services and health outcomes. Um, so when I think about what I do 
uh, and why I'm a doctor in a human services agency, um, uh, I always talk about it as being the right prescription. You know, when I worked uh, 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 as a working pediatrician, uh, I could, you know, I can treat a sore throat. I have a prescription for. Uh, for ear infections and I can bandage wounds, but I didn't have a prescription for poverty or inadequate access to early care and education or, or inadequate uh, access to, um, to, to quality human services. Uh, at least I don't on the outside. On the inside where I'm doing this work, um, I can address those circumstances beyond my clinical practice walls that have a much greater impact on the health and well-being of the families that I'm seeing. So no matter how much I'm talking about breastfeeding on the inside in my office, unless I can do something about what's happening in the workplace, uh, for folks and making laws and policies that have an impact on whether or not uh, there's adequate access to places to store milk and rooms to breastfeed, then um, you know I'm not really doing the, my job as well as I possibly can. And these are all the things that, that I like to like that we talk about as being the social determinants of health uh, and well-being. It's really those factors again for me outside of my clinical practice walls that make the largest difference. Um, you know those those social, economic, and physical conditions into which people are born um, and live. And, and those examples include uh, growing up in a high crime neighborhood or living in older homes with poisonous lead uh, or attending poor quality schools. Again, things I was just sort of mentioning that I didn't have a prescription for on the outside, but in a sense I do have a prescription for and the right prescription uh, working within ACF. Uh, and again, these influence these. Uh, these factors have a very direct and important impact on health outcomes. So, how do the social determinants of breastfeeding of, of uh, social determinants of health impact breastfeeding? You know, just, some, just a couple of examples: of lack of education about the benefits um, can be an, can certainly impact hourly rates, hourly rate jobs that don't allow for maternity leave uh, or time to feed and bond uh, with child. Lack of workplace supports, as I mentioned before, for breastfeeding or for storage of milk, and certainly other things that you can imagine happening out in the community uh, or out uh, in the sort of social determinant setting that don't allow to to support uh, breastfeeding as we'd like to see it done. And where does the support for breastfeeding come into play uh, in, in my life? Well, certainly in practice, uh, you know, around guidance, of course, as a, as a pediatrician. Uh, and consultation, bringing in lactation consultant as a part of our practice. My practice is right here in town. Uh, we think it's very important to have that available. And, uh, and support, and support in that I like to engage everyone who's involved with the child around breastfeeding issues. So it's not just the mom; it's the it's the it's actually the brother and sister who actually are now concerned because mom is giving attention to them in a way that they no longer get it. Because wow, wasn't you know wasn't I the one breastfeeding? Or why what you know why is uh, why is this happening with my little sister? And uh, and I and I you know bring kids into the bring kids into the fold, and of course bringing fathers into the fold, and also grandma and auntie and anybody else <laughs> who has advice, because one of the things I tell parents, and those of you who are parents will understand this, is that everybody's got advice for you. Um, from, their, from your minister, to the neighbor around the corner, to the person who runs the grocery store. But you know your child better than anybody in the world, and the decisions you make for your child will be right 99% um, of the time, and that 1% of the time when it's not right, it'll be okay, because they're very hard to break. And so where does it come into play with respect to policy, uh, again, within, within ACF? Um, our program performance standards in many of our, uh, in many of our programs uh, and other requirements are explicit in expectations regarding promotion of breastfeeding and support for parents who are breastfeeding their babies. Uh, here are some examples. The Early Head Start program. Uh, the Early Head Start programs are funded to serve pregnant women, infants, and toddlers up to three years of age. The program requirements include education and supports for breastfeeding. Specifically, uh, grantee and delegate agencies must provide information on the benefits of breastfeeding to all pregnant and nursing mothers. For those who choose to breastfeed in center-based programs, arrangements must be provided as necessary. Uh, I, also, for programs serving infants and toddlers, facilities must be available for the proper storage and handling of breast milk and formula. And again, that's very specific within the program standards for folks who receive money from the federal government to run an early Head Start program. In January of 2014, 
Congress appropriated $500 million to expand early learning slots for infants and toddlers through Early Head Start and Child Care Partnerships, or new Early Head Start grants. The funding opportunity announcement for this is expected in the spring, so you're sort of getting a sort of a, a little bit of a preview. Um, generally, the same requirements will, will apply, uh, including education and support regarding breastfeeding. So again, making sure that that is included in this new expansion of our early childhood programming. But the maternal and infant and early childhood home visiting program is designed to improve outcomes for at-risk children and families through evidence-based home visiting programs. Home visiting coordinates work at the federal, state, and local levels. This program was established at the federal government level uh, in 2010 as part of the Affordable Care Act and is administered by the Human Health Resources and Services Administration and the Administration for Children and Families. The home visiting grants are made to states and tribal communities to deliver effective evidence-based early childhood home visiting programs to pregnant women, expectant fathers, and parents and primary caregivers of young children birthed to kindergarten entry in communities identified through statewide needs assessments as being quote unquote at risk. All grantees must report on six benchmarks or uh, six benchmarks and 36 construct areas. Within the maternal and child health benchmark, there is a construct specifically addressing breastfeeding. Um, there's flexibility in developing and defining the construct around breastfeeding, um, and all grantees have a prenatal component, which includes breastfeeding education and support. Some of the examples of the performance measures within the programs uh, used by the home visiting grantees include increasing the percentage of postpartum women in the program who initiate breastfeeding, uh, increasing the average number of weeks that postpartum women in the program breastfeed, uh, and increasing the percentage of pregnant and postpartum women in the program who receive education and support related to breastfeeding. ACF funded 55 organizations across the United States also to provide responsible fatherhood activities. And I think this is actually uh, one of the more critical areas where we can address uh, breastfeeding. And grantees are called upon to help fathers improve their relationships with their spouses, significant others, and or mothers of their children, become better parents, continue to, to continue to be the to contribute to the financial well-being of their children by providing job training. And activities include educating dads about important parenting roles, inclu including supporting wives and partners and breastfeeding infants. And although, you know, we're, we're, the tide is turning, you know, I've been practicing pediatrics Wow, I graduated medical school in 1990, um, so I've been practicing pediatrics since then, and I've seen a little bit of a shift in fathers beginning to understand the importance of breastfeeding more and being able to contribute and support, uh, but I still think we have uh, a, a little bit of a ways, uh, a ways to go. So over the, the past year, we've also been working on the creation of consistent baseline national health and safety standards for use across child care, Head Start, and pre-K programs. We believe that the true, true quality can't uh, be achieved without basic health and safety measures in place. In other words, we're attempting to work towards setting a floor across the early childhood education community from which programs can aspire or move to higher quality and upon which parents can rely. Uh, this work has been based on our work, previous work on caring for our children and calling these new standards caring for our children basics uh, in order to take advantage of our previous federal investment and align the messaging uh, in the field. Breastfeeding is supported in the current version of basics by providing guidance on how to store and heat breast milk in early childhood education settings. Basics will be released in the Federal Register for public comment in the next few weeks. So again, this is an opportunity uh, for you to dive in. If you look and see what's, what's there for support of breastfeeding and education and guidance on breastfeeding, looking at the basics as they come out in for, for, federal, uh, for, for public comment will be an opportunity to have some, some input. So uh, in conclusion, um, I think you'll see that there's widespread support for breastfeeding within, uh, within uh, ACF. Um, particularly in my case, I do so as, as a pediatrician and as a chief medical officer uh, connecting human services to health outcomes. Again, knowing that human services supports are going to be the same kind of supports that are going to help us to promote breastfeeding and again lead to healthier children and healthy outcomes. ACF does it via the policies and program standards that, that assure that programs don't receive money or are actually going to be held accountable for what they do in terms of support of, of breastfeeding. Um, and again, uh, 
um, thank you uh, for the invite. It's always a pleasure to come here and speak. Um, and I'll turn it over to the next speaker. Thank you. I just want to ask you a little bit about home visiting. Sure. One of our biggest problems is what happens when they leave the hospital. Uh, we have 75, 80% of mothers breastfeeding and they drop into this black hole. Now the original research on home visiting was done in Rochester, New York. As you may well know, most good things start in Rochester, <laughs> New York. But to, uh, how is your organization implementing that? Because that's a grassroots thing that could really make a difference. Sure. Well, well, as I said, the program, home visiting itself, uh, is a program that came out of the Affordable Care Act. I think it was $1.5 billion over the course of five years to be delivered to communities that determined to be at risk. And as I mentioned uh, earlier, there are specific um, specific parameters uh, addressing uh, breastfeeding uh, and again there's some flexibility within the programs since these are evidence-based home visiting programs we're um, at at some I wouldn't say restriction but in some respects the the evidence base is why they were selected so if within their evidence base the practice that they use to support breastfeeding shows that it was successful that's what they're going to continue to do so i think in you know in the next round of grants which i believe is coming up i think it's going to be to, to be refunded and hopefully um, expanded uh, again when those things come up for public comment if you see areas where you say, wow, you know, you guys did a really great job, you've made it, uh, you've given a lot of leeway with respect to how you support breastfeeding, but here are some specific, um, specific things, or maybe one thing that maybe all programs should do if they're a home visiting program and sort of show how it's evidence-based. Uh, so that's one way that we can increase and make sure that we actually have it much more uh, formalized within the home visiting programs. So you're saying that somebody's got to have a successful program first in order to be funded? I think in, in with respect to evidence-based programming funding, yes. <laughs> it has to be based in, in the science. I mean, we know the science, um, and we know what works, but in the case of a home visiting program, does it work, it, you know, does it work in a specific home visiting model? Uh, so again, we know that, we know what kids need. We know they need to be, uh, we know that, well, we I'm know. I'm sure we have a lot of people in our audience who, who have needs and who are interested in, uh, really enlarging and strengthening the programs uh, locally in their communities. So they should watch your website? Uh, well, they should watch certainly hhs.gov, keep an eye on the news. Um, these, I mean, this is a, actually the home visiting program is a very popular uh, and a very public and transparent uh, process. So uh, but definitely keep an eye on it, especially if it's, if it's related to the ACA, you know it's going to be out there and home visiting is actually part of the Affordable Care Act. Well, thank you. Sure, my pleasure. Really my pleasure. We'll make you answer some more questions in a few minutes. All right. <laughs>